time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Donald I. Rogers, an editor of the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Robert Morris, special counsel for the Internal Security Subcommittee. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Morris, I believe that you have been counsel for what is generally known as the McCarran Committee. Is that correct, That's sir? That's right, Mr. Ewing. For 17 months, you've been engaged in an important investigation. Is that correct? Well, Mr. Ewing, the investigation that we have been carrying on has been an investigation of the Institute of Pacific Relations and the effect that that organization was able to have on the foreign policy of the United States with respect to Far Eastern matters. To identify this Institute of Pacific Relations, sir, this is a communist front organization, is it not? Well, I, I think that the, uh, the thing to do, the way to answer that, Mr. Rogers, is to say that the Institute of Pacific Relations was set up as a, a scholarly research organization. It was, in, uh, it was international in character, and as I say, it was set up for the professed purpose of uh, specializing in research and study. According to the evidence, after the committee held hearings, uh, since la open hearings since last July, examining thousands of documents, introducing the many of those documents into the record, the uh, Senate Internal Security Subcommittee and the Senate Judiciary Committee held that the Institute of Pacific Relations has not maintained the character of an objective, scholarly, and research organization. In this lack of objectivity, in what direction did the IPR lean? Well, the Judiciary Committee this afternoon reported that a small core of officials and staff members carried out the main burden of IPR activities and directed its administration and policies in a communist and pro-communist direction. Now, that report this afternoon has resulted in recommendations for the indictment of Owen Lattimore, has it not? Well, that's not quite true, Mr. Rogers, not quite precise. The uh, committee held this afternoon that Owen Lattimore testified falsely before the subcommittee with reference to at least five separate matters that were relevant to the inquiry and substantial in import. And on the basis of that, conclusion of untruthful testimony, it asks the Department of Justice turn over to a grand jury the question of whether or not Owen Lattimore did commit perjury. Yes. Now, uh, <coughs> the important thing is this, sir. After 17 months of hard work and listening to 66 witnesses, you have released to the American people tonight the report of your committee. Is that correct, sir? That's right. Senator McCarran uh, and, filed and it with the Senate this afternoon. And, and this is, is it a unanimous report? It was unanimous with respect to the, the conclusions of the Internal Security Subcommittee, and it was unanimously cleared by the Senate Judiciary. And, and you're telling uh, our, our viewers, of course, have heard a great deal of argument in the last few years concerning one Professor Lattimore and certain people who were, co were pro-communist. Now, you're saying that your, your committee has issued a unanimous report. Both Democrats and Republicans have subscribed to this report. Is That's that correct, right. sir? That's right. All you all have 13 members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and, and this, this is a unanimous report of that committee. Well, it, it's, it was unanimous uh, with respect to the seven members of the Internal Security Subcommittee, and then when the Senate Judiciary Committee met, there were no negative votes on that. Oh, now, and these are the recommendations that you are making to our, uh, to our viewers and that you've made to the, to the people of the United States. Number one, that some action, grand jury action, be taken against Professor Lattimore. Uh, that, that is correct. I see. Now, uh, you, you mentioned a man named John Peyton Davies, Jr. Well, well will, you, will you identify him for our viewers? Well, John Peyton Davies is presently the deputy political advisor to the United States High Commissioner in Germany. He was, in 1949, uh, a member of the top planning staff of the State Department. The committee uh, took testimony 
in connection with a recommendation that he made in 1949 to C two CIA agents that six people be employed and utilized by the CIA uh, for to give guidance and to consult with and to give direction to a certain project that CIA had in mind at that time. Now that's CIA. You're, you're saying that a man who is currently an important figure in our government recommended that our Central Intelligence Agents Agency hire at least four communists. Is that correct? Yes. Of the six people, four of them, according to the testimony and the evidence in our record, had had communist connections, and three had been expressly identified as members of the Communist Party. Now, what is what is Professor Lattimore's uh, present activity? Well, he's director of the Walter Hines Page School of International Relations at Johns Hopkins University. All right. Doc Dr. Lattimore is now a professor at Johns Hopkins. He's a director. And Mr. Davies is, is a high official in our government in Germany. That's correct. And you have recommended grand jury action against both of these men. We have asked the, the Senate Judiciary Committee asked that the Department of Justice turn the matter over to a grand jury for them to determine whether or not those two gentlemen committed perjury. How about these sir? other names that we see in the news as you have investigated? Uh, how about, uh, for instance, uh, uh, well, Mr. Barnes, Mr. Joseph Barnes? Well, uh, Joseph Barnes came into the investigation only uh, indirectly. It's true that he was the secretary of the American Council in 1934, but he, he, he then directed most of his activities outside of the Institute. What is he doing now? Uh, well, I understand he's the uh, executive vice president of Simon & Schuster. I think that's his Now, name. how about Freddie Vanderbilt Field? Well, Frederick Vanderbilt Field succeeded Mr. Barnes as secretary of the American Council of the Institute of Pacific Relations in 1934 and held that position until 1940. Uh, he was, from 1940 until 1947, he was very active in the Institute. In fact, even after 1947, he was the custodian and the repository of the Institute of Pacific Relations old files. They were in his basement up here until very recently. Now, did you find evidence that uh, some of these men who are now high officials of our government, that they dealt directly with Russian agents? Oh, yes. The record is, is replete with such things, Mr. Ewing. Now, you mentioned a man named Vladimir Rogoff. Well, Mr. Rogoff, Vladimir Rogoff is, uh, according to the evidence before the subcommittee, is an important uh, intelligence agent, Soviet intelligence agent, who operated in China. In fact, in 1943, it was his article in War in the Working Class that appeared in, uh, that signalized a change in, in attitude on the part of the whole Soviet organization toward China. And we find that Vladimir Rogoff, when he came into the United States just one year later, in January 1944, did come to the IPR office, did meet the then Secretary General Edward C. Carter, who sent him down to Washington to meet high IPR officials and to meet policymakers in Washington. Now, sir, uh, to, to make this clear to our, our viewers, uh, is, it, is, is this what you found? Did you find that the, this Institute of Pacific Relations, and there were many uh, good Americans Yes, indeed. To there were, we can't it. stress that enough, Mr. Ewing. There were many people who joined it who didn't know what it was really doing. That's that right. The, the committee found that most members and, and most trustees were not aware of what the inner core of the organization was doing. But, but you, you did find that this inner core was, in effect, an instrument of Soviet policy between the years of 1941 on down, at least to 1949. That is substantially the finding of the committee today, Mr. Ewing. Uh, that that it, it attempted to, uh, did, did it attempt to, to uh, present false information to the American people? That's right. The, uh, the committee found substantially that it presented information that was slanted in the communist direction throughout the years. Now, has there been evidence that the influence of this committee has affected, uh, seriously affected, our foreign policy, our Far Eastern policy. Yes. The, the official policy of the United States government has been affected by the Institute of Pacific Relations. That is right, Mr. Rogers. I, I'll, I'll mention a few of the findings of the Senate Judiciary Committee today. A group of persons operating within and about the Institute of Pacific Relations exerted a substantial influence on the United States Far Eastern policy. The IPR was a vehicle used by the communists to orientate American Far Eastern policies toward communist objectives. A group of persons associated with the IPR attempted, 
between 1941 and 1945 to change United States policy so as to accommodate communist ends and to set the stage for a major United States policy change favorable to the Soviet Union in 1945. Well, now, now, Mr. Morris, was there evidence, this is important for our viewers before the close of our show, is there evidence that members of the IPR actually collaborated with members of Soviet intelligence? Yes, in addition to the Rogoff incident, and by the way, when, when Mr. Carter sent Rogoff to Washington, he selected Lachlan Curry and Al Hiss as the two government people who should guide Mr. Rogoff when he was in Washington. In addition, we had a conference uh, in 1941 during the Hitler-Stalin and the uh, uh, Russo-Japanese Pact, wherein Owen Lattimore was appointed on the recommendation of the president to be an advisor to Chiang Kai-shek in China. Now, there's just one final question, sir. Can our members of our audience, our viewers, get copies of this important report? Yes, the, uh, the reports will be available tomorrow, I believe, possibly the next day, and they can be obtained through the government printing office in Washington. Well, thank you very much for being with us tonight, sir. It's a pleasure to be here, Mr. Young. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Donald I. Rogers. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Robert Morris, special counsel for the Internal Security Subcommittee. Now, many persons have special requirements in their watches, and it's always been the policy of Longines to produce watches to serve every possible need. Here are a few examples. Servicemen, sportsmen, yachtsmen, and others look for a moisture-proof watch of really fine quality and superior performance. Here is one such, made by Longines. This, by the way, is the only watch that kept going throughout the 23-day ordeal of the Rickenbacker adventure on the raft in the Pacific. If you're a pilot, or do some amateur sports timing, or if you make scientific time studies, this Longines strap chronograph is the watch that's made to order for you. Another interesting technical watch is this one, which we call the Longines Split Second Chronograph. A watch, by the way, adaptable to a host of very difficult timing problems. And not to forget the ladies. There are beautiful and serviceable models for doctors, nurses, or sportswomen, of which these are examples. Actually, Longines Whitnor makes fine watches in the largest variety of styles and types of any watch company in the world. Your authorized Longines Whitnor jeweler is qualified to advise you on the best type of watch for your use. In all probability, he can show you just the watch you need, but if not, he can call on the factory for the type and style of watch that you require. And remember that you may buy and own, or buy and proudly give, a Longines watch for as little as seventy-one fifty. Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Wetnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Wetnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Wetnor Watches. Tune in the conventions on the CBS television network.